Hi, everyone. Welcome to the post-pandemic ascent, the role of migration in emerging from the economic and labor market turmoil. I'm Megan Benton. I'm the research director for MPI's international work um, and also for MPI Europe. It's been a seismic year for migration, to put it mildly. So we're really thrilled today to be partnering with the OECD to discuss the, the impact of the pandemic on migration and mobility systems, uh, to discuss findings from OECD's international migration outlook, and to look ahead to what the, the future might hold for economies, labor markets, and migration. Um, I have to start with our housekeeping notes, as always. Um, if you have any technical problems, excuse me, I will get that slide open. If you have any technical problems, please email events at migrationpolicy.org, or you can call 202-266-1929 and talk to Lisa. Um, we won't have uh, an interactive Q&A for this event, but we warmly encourage audience participation. We miss you. We wish we could be doing in-person events. Um, so please add your comments, uh, questions to the Q&A or the chat box on the side of your screens, uh, and we'll have time to, to get to those later. For those of you who are joining by phone and you can't do that, you can also email events at migrationpolicy.org or you can tweet at Migration Policy or hashtag MPI Discuss. So in many ways, this is a, a, a strange time to be having a conversation about the role of immigration in the economic recovery. We're facing an extremely grim second, if not third wave in many OECD countries, prolonged travel, border restrictions, another wave of lockdown with all their devastating effects. Um, by all accounts, we're on the eve of a very tough winter and recovery seems a long way off. And it's also a time of deep uncertainty. So we don't know how different sectors will come out of the COVID wash, whether restaurants and tourism will rebound, whether new jobs will emerge, whether in tech or green energy or telehealth. We don't know whether the pandemic will spell the end of bricks and mortar retail. We don't know how effective countries will be in some of their creative efforts to think about skills and jobs matching at a period of low migration, about unlocking the value in domestic workers, whether they're out of work natives or recent arrivals or even unauthorized immigrants. But there's also a feeling, uh, especially today, that we may be turning a page. We have a new US president elect and a change in administration ahead. So there's promising news um, about the effectiveness of a new COVID vaccine and this and others that are in the pipeline could begin to open up societies and cross-border travel at, at some point. So it's a good time to go back to basics and think about the role of immigration in building strong economies, how to make immigration work for all members of society in tough times. So what we're going to do with today's event is, is two things, really. One uh, is to take stock understand what's really happened this year to immigration. And then the second is to look ahead to 2021 and beyond and think about the likely economic fallout of the second wave, the likely impact on labor markets, on migration policies and systems. And I'm so thrilled we have a really great lineup of speakers to address this topic. Um, Jonathan Chalif is a senior policy analyst and comparative migration policy expert at the International Migration Division of the OECD. He's written a huge number of reports on labor migration, on labor market integration, and has provided direct policy advice uh, to governments and non-governmental organizations for 20 years. Jean-Christophe Dumont has been the head of the International Migration Division at the OECD since 2011, and he's worked for the OECD on migration issues uh, since the year 2000. And then Dimitri Papadimitriou co-founded MPI and was its first president until 2014. He remains president emeritus and distinguished transatlantic fellow, which for those of you who are wondering means that we still put him to a lot of work. He convenes the Transatlantic Council on Migration, as well as lots of other things. <laughs> uh, we're going to kick off um, with a presentation from Jonathan. Um, so drawing some of the key findings from OECD's recent international migration outlook. And then we're going to have a conversation with uh, between Jean-Christophe and Dimitri on what the future might hold. So, Jonathan, I'm going to turn to you. What impact has the pandemic had on migration flows, on labor markets? Uh, and give us your, your takeaways from this year. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Megan. Thanks, Dimitri. Uh, thanks to all the MPI colleagues. Uh, it's, really, it's really great to be in this, this webinar. 
So I'd just like to go very quickly. I have really only three slides to show today uh, to kick off the discussion, and I'll go right into that. So first, this is really no surprise to anyone who's been awake this year uh, that there's been a crash in migration flows. And we, we, the recent International Migration Outlook, we quantify uh, this through the end of the, the second quarter. Uh, and I'll talk a bit about that and, and what we see going into the, the, the second half of the year. Uh, if you look, compare the first semester of 2020 with the first, uh, first semester of 2019, all the, the inflows, new visas and permits, fell by about 46%. And if we look only at the second quarter, compared to the same period in 2019, it was 72% down. So that's a massive drop, but it's not a complete halt. Uh, and you can see from this chart that the decline wasn't the same everywhere. Uh, in Europe, it wasn't quite as severe. So it was about 35% down in the first semester and almost 60% down in the second quarter. Uh, so in other parts of the OECD, the, the drop was much, much steeper. And you had border closures and uh, consular closures and, and much more strict um, uh, halt on migration. And it's not that the measures were imposed later, because more or less a lot of these restrictions were put in at the same time but because the measures were a bit less restrictive in most European countries, and you still had quite a few categories of uh, immigrants who were allowed to enter, uh, permanent residents, EU nationals, key workers, uh, but also a wide range of, uh, of exceptions for very specific categories. Uh, if you look at North America, at the US and Canada here, you can see that the summer was really a challenge, especially for temporary migration uh, in both countries. Both take quite a few international students and summer workers, uh, and both of those categories were very sharply curtailed. Uh, it was not a good summer for international students trying to get a visa around the OECD, although a few countries actually, for example, France did make a very strong effort to try to get uh, visas, and you can see some of that effect uh, in the figures for, for entries. Uh, the main channel still keeping temporary workers going around the OECD is seasonal agricultural workers and temporary ag agricultural workers. And if you look at countries like the US, this ended up being the majority of that, the all temporary migrants, uh, where it's usually just a small part. If we shift to the Pacific OECD countries, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, and, and also Korea, you can see a real shutdown in the entries, practically no migration for months. And even now, these countries are still not admitting very many uh, immigrants. And very many foreigners, it's, it's, uh, it's, they're maintaining a very, very low uh, inflow. If you look at, uh, back to Europe, you can see that there is a, a rebound uh, in the summer, uh, partly because you have consulates reopening, a lot of the migration for family and free movement, and that makes up a lot of the entries that are recorded in these graphs. And if we look towards uh, the July and September period, you see actually many European countries a return towards the pre-pandemic levels, uh, not quite the same level, but for many categories of migrants moving back in that direction as, as people are starting to get visas and, and permits. Move to the next slide. Uh, if we look at the impact of COVID-19 on employment, the overall takeaway from this chart uh, is that it's had a much bigger negative effect on immigrants than on the native born in most OECD countries. And the year to year to decline in employment is it's really notable in the countries on the left side of this chart, Canada, Spain, uh, Ireland, US. If the countries, if you look at the, uh, the differences between these countries, it reflects more the range in support measures to keep people in employment so countries that had schemes like paid furlough and employer subsidies to keep staff, they obviously saw less of an impact on everyone, immigrants and, and natives. But even so, for immigrants, it was still usually a worse impact because they disproportionately work in temporary jobs, part-time jobs, have weaker protection, may even be in informal employment. Uh, so the country-to-country -country differences look big, but I think that uh, if you were to phase out some of these job support measures, you would see less of a difference. Uh, and the main takeaway here, I think, is that no matter what the national context is, the impact on, on migrants uh, is generally generally worse. I'll move to my last 
slide, and this is looking forward at the prospects for recovery in the labor market as a whole. Uh, the OECD projections are that employment won't be back to pre-crisis levels anytime before 2022. And the projections that were done could actually take into account two scenarios. One, that the virus is more or less defeated by the end of the 2020. Uh, and the other scenario, that there's a second wave, the double hit scenario. And in both scenarios, you still have a massive jobs deficit at the end of 2021. So even if we had escaped the second wave, uh, which we didn't, obviously, I'm speaking to you today as pretty much the only person in, in my office out of 180, and, uh, and it just took me two official forms just to ride my bike here. So I think that's a good sign that at least some countries are in a second wave. Now, the impact on employment isn't the same across countries. Uh, these projections consider that in a double hit scenario, the employment levels in the US and Canada are hit much harder this year, uh, but actually start to recover in 2021, even in a double hit scenario. Uh, the projection for the Euro area is that in the second wave scenario, the employment levels will keep falling all through next year. So I'll close on this reflection. Uh, uh, the shock will obviously have a very long lasting effect in the labor market uh, and where any of the needs are and where the demand for labor uh, is and isn't. And I'll leave it to the rest of the discussion to address what this means for migration and integration policy. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for being uh, so disciplined with your time, for making it into the office as the only one of so many people, and for that really uh, great job of simplifying this very complex picture of of exceptions and how they've resulted in geographical variation and, and differences of employment. Um, I know I have a lot of questions for you already, and I'm sure that the audience does too, um, but we are going to go straight to the discussion between Jean-Christophe and Dimitri. So in the meantime, I wanted to encourage those of you who are watching and already have questions for Jonathan to type questions into the Q&A or chat box on the right side of your screen or, or send them to events at migrationpolicy.org or tweet your questions to at Migration Policy or hashtag MPI Discuss. I'll start collecting the questions already uh, while we go into um, the next uh, segment. Uh, so I wanted to start with uh, Jean-Christophe, if that's okay. Um, we are, of course, seeing a dramatic resurgence in infections, increasing hospitalizations, a new wave of lockdowns. What do you think this means for the next three to six months? What does that look like in relation to the economy and migration? Well, I think as Jonathan just said, I think the uh, outlook is not, uh, it's not very uh, positive and uh, the employment loss uh, uh, might uh, even be uh, larger uh, to some extent uh, as the impact on businesses uh, start to uh, unfold notably European country, which where employment has been uh, cautioned by uh, a very uh, large job retention schemes. So the question is really uh, where uh, shortages, uh, labor shortages and skill shortages may be, and what can be the role uh, for migration in, in, in this context. Uh, I think uh, certainly on, on these points, uh, the number one, uh, the number one priority for all governments across the OECD is to mobilize the domestic workforce, including immigrants. Um, it's, we know that immigrants, uh, have been in the front line, el helping everyone, uh, with health, uh, but also, uh, delivering our food in the supermarket, uh, throughout the lockdowns. They have also been in the front line regarding, uh, the pandemic. And the, uh, uh, the infection rate for immigrants, uh, for the country where we have data shows that they are, uh, uh usually, uh, twice as much affected than, uh, than native born for, for a number of, of reasons. Again, that may be linked to their employment status, but also their housing condition, the fact that they use more public transportation, so on and so forth. This, uh, this group is also very much affected by the economic condition, as Jonathan just, uh, shown, uh, of, uh, of the pandemic. 
And um, it's very important in this in this first period that we really uh, make sure that uh, all the uh, measures we uh, implement uh, to help our workers uh, are mainstream and reach out to uh, legally staying immigrants as much as to non-immigrants. Uh, but we don't uh, reduce our efforts on integration. Uh, it may look like uh, money should go somewhere else, uh, but this is really a time where we should uh, keep our, uh, our investment on integration. Um, but also, uh, we need to make sure that the uh, skills development schemes uh, are also reaching out to immigrants. Uh, the job will be, there, there will be new jobs. We don't know, as you as said, Megan, exactly where they will be. But there will be new jobs, uh, and we need to make sure that uh, people with foreign uh, qualification have a chance uh, to get their qualification recognized or and uh, to have access to uh, training programs so that they can uh, find their way in, in, in this uh, recovery in the labor market. Thank you so much, Jean-Christophe. Uh, Dimitri, same question, maybe with more of a pessimistic slant, since I know you well. How bad will the, <laughs> how bad will this next, next six months be for the pandemic and the economic fallout? And what do you see as the likely impact on labor markets and on immigration? Yes, I guess I'm the designated pessimist. Um, I think that um, both uh, Jonathan and Jean-Christophe uh, set the stage extremely well. Um, the effects of the pandemic are going to be deeper and longer lasting. And I think that it's important for us to learn a little bit from the past, not just the 2008 and 2009 uh, crisis, but also other crises that we have had, that we are going to have a significant amount of structural unemployment. And that structural unemployment is going to hit two groups, particularly. The first one are young workers, where we're going to see prolonged scarring. And the second one are older workers, people who are in their 50s, who lost their jobs, who will have a very hard time getting back onto the labor force. And of course, that means everything, you know, regarding travel and migration will be affected as a result. I want to emphasize one time uh, again that some of the adjustments that we have to make um, are going to be uh, very deep and they are going to have an effect on employment and on entire industries and sectors. You know, for instance, working virtually, meeting virtually, office work, and all of the things that are associated with offices. All of those things you know, are now going to cut deep and they're going to actually make permanent changes in the way that we do these things. And I also want to uh, emphasize again something that Jean Christophe said very well as his last statement. This is an opportunity for us to invest in people, in all the people, immigrants, regardless of whether they're here, they're here permanently or temporarily. Even immigrants who may have been here, or by here, I mean in our countries illegally, but have contributed extremely generously to our societies, all of our societies. And also, this is a time for us to make one extra investment on something that some countries have not really been making much of an investment, immigrant integration. We need to really think about skilling, helping people with their skills. We need to move away from just supporting people or businesses uh, to that, to, in order to remain um, alive, as it were, and people to continue to have, uh, to be employed. And we need to start subsidizing jobs. It, this is time for us to subsidize jobs to pay for part of someone's salary and wages. This way we can encourage employers 
to hire people that they might not have hired in previous times because simply immigration was sort of uh, large enough that they could always opt to hire new immigrants. Thank you. Thanks, both of you, um, for, for those great opening remarks. Um, I wanted to push you both on the implications for immigration policy. So you both talked about the impact on different groups of workers, the implications for the integration and skills policy. I'd, I like your phrase, Dimitri, the importance of investing in people and how we need to think about these things from a workforce development, not just an immigrant integration perspective. But what does this mean for immigration policymakers who were trying to be forward looking and think about the next three years? So right now we're in this kind of holding pattern. We don't know how long the pandemic will last and how bad the economic dam damage will be. But if you're a, a forward looking strategic immigration policymaker, what's your what's your one piece of advice? Uh, Jean-Christophe first. Well, um, first thing that uh, we know that the impact on migration will be long lasting. Uh, uh, so beyond uh, the travel bans and, and the current uh, restrictions, um, if we take the example of the 2008 crisis in Europe, which was partly hit, uh, the number of uh, work permit for more than 12 months went from uh, more than 500,000 uh, in 20, uh, in 2008 to uh, 223,000 in uh, 2012. And that was the result of, uh, of a three percent GDP drop. So you can imagine that uh, as far as labor migration is concerned, the impact will be uh, probably even larger. I think uh, uh, rightly so all countries have put uh, a break on mobility uh, to uh, um, prevent uh, the spread of a virus. Uh, that is, and that was and is still uh, largely necessary. But uh, one piece of advice is, I think, uh, that we need to start thinking about how to reopen border uh, safely. Uh, so it's not a trade-off, uh, but I think we need to. Uh, start about uh, thinking about serious ways to uh, enable mobility um, because this is uh, this is part of our economies and our, our life for students, for families, uh, and in some cases for for workers. Actually, countries have uh, had exceptions uh, to a number of uh, of uh, workers uh, during the pandemic, showing the importance of of uh, migration. I think there is a second uh, point, uh, which is about not those who will be coming, but those who are already in the country. And I'm not talking here about integration, which is discussed, but I'm talking about uh, enabling people to maintain a lawful residence. And what we've seen uh, during the, the first phase of the crisis of the lockdowns is that OECD countries have all uh, or most of them uh, put in place very generous contingency measures. They have uh, about half of OECD countries, uh, 16 actually have uh, uh, in implement automatic extension of uh, residence permit for three, six months, sometimes uh, during the all uh, emergency period. Uh, they have uh, removed obligation to leave the territory for those who are not able to do so. Uh, they have enabled uh, people to change employers uh, when that was a restriction associated to, to the permit. Uh, they have enabled students uh, notably to work uh, more hours in, than, than usually uh, authorized, and so on and so forth. But uh, what is clear is um, that uh, when all these measures uh, will phase out, and they will at some point, some have already, uh, we may end up with a large number of people in, in a limbo, uh, with uh, very limited opportunities to go back, uh, certainly very limited economic opportunities, and, um, and also some difficulties from destination country to force returns, uh, uh, whatever that means. And so uh, the risk is, uh, is really that we just contribute to grow the number of people 
uh, again, uh, in a tolerated status or in, in kind of a weak position, which we know in the long run would be the wrong thing uh, to do. So, reopen borders safely and take care about those who are in the country in precarious status to make sure that they have a way, uh, a legal pathway. Thank you so much. Um, and Dimitri, Jean-Christophe just gave us a really clear roadmap there of the different areas for policy innovation, but many of them are outside immigration policy from lifting mobility restrictions to regular innovation and thinking through how to address people in limbo. These are really complex topics. And what does that mean for immigration policy and governance, do you think? Uh, thank you again. And, um... It's a little disconcerting when Jean-Christophe and I, in other words, two of your speakers, <laughs> agree on everything. So <laughs> this is not good. Next time we have to think of a different panel where we can disagree. But um, it seems to me that this is the time for a grand bargain in terms of the immigrants that we have in our countries. These have been contributors. This, many of these people have actually lost their lives. They are the essential workers, the frontline workers. This is completely a non-brainer. But in certain places, like the United States, this is also a very difficult thing to move forward with. And in order for that grand bargain to work, it seems to me that in order for us to take the steps that are necessary and incorporate into our social policy, health policy, economic policy, you know, employment policy, etc. All of the people who have contributed during these past months and will continue to contribute in the next six months until this thing is somehow defeated, hopefully, um, these people, we have to find a way to create a path for them to regularize their status as a first step. Uh, you know, this isn't about citizenship. This isn't about any of this. It's about creating a path to regularization. And there are countries that have done that. For instance, Canada has given, you know, people who have worked in the health, you know, sort of provision of health services, even at the lowest level, who were there in some sort of a, you know, what uh, Jean-Christophe called tolerated status, who had lost you know, they didn't have the right to remain in Canada, but they have remained and they are contributing. And they have given these people status. Portugal has done the same thing. Italy has, you know, sort of toyed with the same idea. This isn't something that is either out of the blue or that we haven't done before. But in order for that grand bargain to work, we have to be a bit more careful about immigrants that are coming in, new immigrants that are coming in from the outside. We know that in essential worker occupations, in some places like agriculture, the health professions, and the high end of all of these things, we know that you will need people in AI, et cetera, et cetera. So I suspect that perhaps we ought to bifurcate in terms of new immigration. And then it's not just the state that has to be careful about in inviting or, uh, you know, allowing too many immigrants to come in the next one to three years. It is also immigrant families in places where, um, let's say, family migration, it's a common term, family migration is the vast majority, two-thirds to 70 percent of the people who enter the United States, I think some immigrant, house, immigrant households are likely to hold back when they realize how precarious their economic position has become. So I think we all need to work together in order to come up with a reasonable way of opening up again to migration to a very significant degree. But there are other countries, however, and I'll finish on that, that have already made decisions, you know, as we you know, certainly Jean-Christophe and Jonathan, and you know that, uh, Canada has already announced that their new levels are going to be much larger than they were, you know, this year. You know, they went from 250 or 260 a couple of years ago to 350 this past year. And this year, of course, they're not going to get anywhere near that. 
And they are going to have levels this year, they have announced, of over 400,000 new immigrants. So there are going to be some countries that in the quickest possible way and safest way are going to go to the status quo ante. I don't think that every country can afford to do that. Countries that have both a demographic need for immigrants as well as an economic need for immigrants as well as immigration, immigrants, you know, being a significant part of the voting public. In other words, they have no choice but listen to immigrants who really want to reunify with families, employers who need and are expecting to get immigrants. Those countries may simply go to the status quo ante at the fastest possible way. And I think Jonathan's uh, charts already show that some of these you know, countries have done so. Let's not forget, for instance, that Sweden, we're not talking about 50,000 people. We're talking about small numbers. So, you know, we have to be very careful about what those charts really mean. So my sense is there's going to be some immigration. It's going to be new immigration. It's going to be significant. And it has to be put and understood together in this policy table, the decision table, with what it is that we need to do for the people who are already in the United States. Thank you very much, Dimitri. Thank you, both of you. Um, I, I want to move into the crystal ball phase part of the discussion and dive into a few specific topics and think about how different aspects of labor markets and immigration might be transformed after the pandemic is over, so further ahead in the future. The first, there's already a very lively conversation um, going on in the chat function about the impact of labor market disruption and whether this will ultimately reduce demand for labor migration. So obviously, you will know these aren't new trends, but the pandemic has acted as a kind of catalyst for automation, remote work. Dimitri already mentioned a couple of these things. Jean-Christophe, do you think that these trends will change the raw number of labor mig migrants that countries need or the distribution of skills in those who come? So, yeah, indeed, this is, uh, this is a big question uh, that was already there before the pandemic. And I think the pandemic, just, as you said, uh, right in Megan, accelerate the, the process. I think it's it's fair to say that we will see less travel and more telework. Uh, business people aren't flying, and airline uh, companies don't expect them to go back anytime soon. That's for sure. But that that being said, uh, can we can big companies do everything uh, by telework? Uh, what about international uh, companies? Uh, what about uh, security issues in, in the communication? But uh, also, uh, even if uh, the pandemic has boosted uh, part of the previous trends towards uh, the future of work, more digitalization, more automation, more intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, there might be some counterintuitive uh, impact to expect. In some work that uh, we have done uh, with the European Commission on the demography of occupation, we show that uh, it's about 20, 25% of uh, recruitment uh, in growing occupation uh, in OECD countries uh, are made of immigrants. Actually, the share of immigrants in the recruitment in declining occupation is larger. It's about 33%. And this is obvious because uh, uh, when people enter the labor market, they don't want to go in this occupation which are losing employment each and every year. Uh, young people are looking for more sustainable opportunities for themselves and their families. Immigrants take this job because nobody else can take them. And, and clearly this digitalization process doesn't happen overnight. There is always a transition period, a period during which Automation starts, but some recruitment is still needed. And paradoxically, what we may see is persistence of uh, of recruitment needs 
doesn't need to come from abroad. As we said before, these are also people in the country, and we don't know what share of uh, uh, lead of people will be available to take these jobs. But there will be some recruitment needs in this less attractive occupation. There are also all these occupations which cannot be automatized. Uh, care, work, domestic work to a large extent. And there are a third category of, uh, of sectors and occupations uh, where we don't necessarily uh, think this way, uh, but business people do. Uh, the market are mature. So there is no uh, uh, really uh, some opportunities for expansion there. The, the, the investment is low because you don't expect the change in the market. So the opportunity to automatize these markets is relatively limited. I think one one example maybe, and it's really a question mark, uh, is all the food processing industry. In many of these uh, sectors or, or activities, uh, automation would be an option, but doesn't necessarily happen. And we see extremely large share of immigrants in food processing uh, uh, industry. Uh, it goes uh, to 27% uh, in the U.S., 35% in Canada, and so on. And, and here it's, it's probably because, uh, you know, if you just build a plan, you don't want to rebuild a new one with new technology. You just want to use your, what your investment, uh, to, to its end. So, so all that are, are questions, uh, uh, up in the air. Uh, clearly there is a trend. Uh, uh, the market will change. New jobs will appear. Uh, some will disappear. Uh, but, but the need, uh, the fact that, uh, let's say, low skill workers will be replaced by machine, I, I think is not, is not for tomorrow. And the pandemic doesn't, uh, entirely change the game there. Thank you. That was fascinating. And perhaps I could just ask a very quick follow up before we go to Dimitri, which is about the agri agricultural sector, which has been, um, the source of a lot of exceptions, um, you know, lots of shortages that emerged over the summer, and it's been one of the areas of greatest progress. What do you see as the prospects for automation in agriculture? Well, I, I, it, it's tricky. I think there are some technical issues uh, because we're really talking about seasonal agricultural work, uh, picking fruits and vegetables, and not everything can be automatized. It's also true that uh, currently uh, uh, in, in a number of countries, uh, uh, workers are better than machines, so even if machines can do the job, I think uh, there are losses, there are cost issues, it's not obvious uh, uh, all the time. Um, but yes, I think you're right. We've seen, uh, we've seen everywhere in, in, in the U.S. Uh, H2A uh, figures are almost the same as last year. Uh, France uh, brought uh, charter flight from Morocco to pick up the oranges. Uh, Germany uh, also used shuttle flights uh, from Romania and Bulgaria uh, to help. Uh, UK did the same. Uh, same in Australia with uh, Mongols. Uh, from I mean, everywhere uh, it, it's the case that this workforce is, is necessary. I think automation probably uh, is, is a long-term prospect, but again, it's quite a mature uh, market and, and investment uh, opportunities for new investment is, is not that large. Thank you. And Dimitri, lest you say I agree with Jean-Christophe, I'm just going to frame the question very slightly differently. Um, you and I uh, and Kate Hooper wrote a paper on selection systems in changing labor markets, I think two years ago. Do you think the fundamentals have changed since that point, or are they broadly the same? Um, the fundamentals have changed somewhat, but not dramatically enough for anyone to start thinking that there is a new system that now somehow either exists or it is in the office. And let me say a few more words about that. Um, sectors, economic sectors, um, don't change overnight. They change gradually. And in the case of the agricultural sector, exactly as uh, Jean-Christophe said, the seasonal agricultural, and particularly workers that will follow in large countries like, you know, Australia, the United States, Canada, that will basically follow the crop 
In other words, if you look, it's, it's a matter of geography and climate. So today you may need lots of workers in one part of Texas. I'm making this up. You know, and tomorrow you may need them, you know, in Arizona, or you, need, you may need them to sort of go to California, or in California follow, you know, the crops all the way up to the state of Washington on the West Coast. Uh, this will not change overnight. However, we have always also had the experience that when things become very unsettled in terms of labor supply, all of a sudden automation, particularly machines, become more appealing. And this is not the only way that employers and growers in particular are trying to protect themselves. There is an ancillary way, which is start moving to another country and growing crops over there as part of opportunities that the NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, that's called something else, I'm not going to mention it for the international audience, a lot of um, a lot of growers from California and other states essentially started to grow, you know, food and uh, foods and you know vegetables and fruit in um, Mexico. And of course, you can also import many of those things from elsewhere. And even in the most difficult of tasks, which is really something that requires this stoop hard labor, uh, that you know, uh, agriculture is known for, um, such as weeding. There are machines today that can weed. This is where automation and AI come in. You know, there is a machine, for instance, that actually can separate and understand the difference between a weed and a sprout in whatever it is. And those machines are extremely expensive, but, co you know, cooperatives, in other words, large you know, mechanized or, you know, uh, professional operations may simply reach out to those machines. Uh, in the 1960s, when the supply of workers, 1963-64, um, was sort of, sort of cut off because we killed something that we know that we call the Bracero program with Mexico, there was some mechanization. And mechanization has actually continued to advance ever since then. Is this the time where it's, we're going to see a bit of a leap on mechanization? You know, I don't have a crystal ball. Um, uh, will, uh, in any event, will we need workers that will continue to do that kind of work, seasonal work, you know, et cetera, that will continue to, you know, a need to go all over the United States in order to, you know, to, to go into milk combines, et cetera, et cetera. Of course we will. This is not about no immigration versus immigration the way that it appeared, temporary migration the way that it used to be. But gradually, we may see some changes. We may also see, and this is something that, of course, labor unions that focus on agriculture would hope that they might be able to, to sort of uh, see and encourage. We may also see some people going to that kind of work if both the conditions and the wages in that sector were to change. Again, I don't have a crystal ball, and it could very well be that American consumers will say, you know, I don't want to pay an extra whatever, 20% more for milk or for strawberries or what have you. But there is a possibility that we may see, you know, some readjustment. In the interim, I think it's exactly as you have written and, and discussed and Jean-Christophe and all that, we're likely to see that a lot of the, um, the jobs that existed prior to this pandemic will be automated, will disappear. But we also know that dynamic economies, you know, because the cauldron, you know, the, the laboratory, you know, this is going to be the United States um, because European societies are much more organized than we are. But if you look at the United States, we're going to lose permanently a large number of jobs. But we also 
are going to be gaining large numbers of jobs in areas that we may not be thinking about today. That's why, you know, I like us to look at, you know, the next one to three years. And the first year is pretty much, you know, what uh, Jonathan said. By the end of 20, 2021, we're still going to be in trouble. And we're going to have structural unemployment for young workers and for older workers. And that's going to take quite a while sort of to go for that to go sort of through the system. It's like following the progress of, you know, an animal that a boa constrictor probably ate, a large animal or a python <laughs> through, you know, the various stages. It's going to take a while, but in the next two or three years, more jobs, different jobs, will also appear. And I think we have to be mindful of this. Um, it's um, an area that requires extreme wisdom, which we won't have here in the United States. I can guarantee you that. I don't have to speculate. Okay? And humility. Humility in the sense that we just don't know nearly as much about this, you know, how the economy and will evolve in the next three years as we think that we do. Hence, we ought to be careful about how much new migration we need and in which sectors we need the assistance of newcomers. Thank you. Thanks, Dimitri. And I'm sorry you don't have a crystal ball. That is the only reason we have you on. So that's disappointing. And uh, please don't come again. <laughs> You're muted now. Um, thank you for those comments, both of you. I mean, you both pointed to the fact that it's not just that jobs are disappearing, but the newer jobs are emerging, that higher skilled specialist jobs are emerging. And a lot of people would reject the narrative that it's that jobs are disappearing, it's that jobs are changing. Um, so I wanted to ask one more question before I bring Jonathan back in, and this is about the impact for the super skilled um, and what the top destinations will be. How do you think the pandemic might shake up the global race for talent? And if I could ask you to keep your comments brief so that we can bring Jonathan back in. We already have lots of um, questions teed up from the audience, and please keep them coming. So, um, uh, Jean-Christophe, the global race for talent. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, uh, I, I, I am sure uh, Dimitri will agree on, on this one again. Uh, this is, uh, talent migration is not state driven. Uh, it's, it's the ID skill we choose, uh, the countries and maybe the firms as well. I think in, in that spirit, uh, uh, what's gonna change, uh, most likely is that, uh, people will not only look for, uh, better jobs, uh, better wages, um, better opportunities for their family, but also they will be looking for health security. They will be looking for access to healthcare, quality of healthcare, the cost of healthcare. And that might contribute to, uh, reshuffle a little bit, uh, the talent map, uh, in, in, in a way. Um, what we will see is probably less mobile talent, maybe more opportunity for telework, but we will see increasing competition for talent. If you look at the, uh, EU migration pack, there's a whole section on, uh, on, on bringing more talents to the EU. If you look at the UK policy changes, it's all about bringing talents to the UK. Uh, if you even look at Japan, for example, Japan, uh, yes, there are travel ban right now, but, uh, as very clear objective in terms of, uh, bringing in more highly skilled workers to, to Japan. And I could go on. Dimitri mentioned the uh, role of migration in the Canadian recovery plan. Yes, again, uh, more talent to Canada. So competition will increase, or the demand for these talents will increase, while maybe their mobility will be reduced. And I think in this perspective, uh, uh, for those of you who have not necessarily attended the uh, a joint event, we organized what, uh, was it, Dimitri began about a year ago on merit-based systems. Uh, I think you can go back to that, and, and I, I think countries uh, uh, who have uh, less flexible migration system will be lagging behind this race. And uh, we need, uh, countries need flexible system, evaluation, policy tools. Uh, they need to think about the transition between temporary and permanent migration. And if you don't 
uh, do that in a current uh, framework, yes, uh, you'll be lagging behind because uh, others uh, are not. Thank you very much. And uh, I don't know if it was a year ago or 10 years ago, I honestly <laughs> couldn't tell you. Um, it is available online. <laughs> um, I wanted to bring Jonathan in here. Actually, Jonathan, lots of the questions that have come through the Q&A have been for you, so it's great to, to have you back. And perhaps the first one uh, could be about the implications for integration policy. So both Jean-Christophe and Dimitri pointed to the need for, for, for strong integration policies right now, but we have potentially funding cuts, uh, implications of having to do these things under social distancing measures, online courses, and in some cases, huge burdens on, on immigrants, such as you know, raising family and juggling family and, and difficult work demands. Um, what do you see as the implications for integration policy? I think that's an important question, and uh, you can already see some of the short-term responses in the integration policy. Uh, I mean, I think the first point, which has already been raised, is equal access, equality of access, and that's one of the, the main questions is, are immigrants able to access the exact same services that are being offered uh, to support uh, all workers through uh, this, 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 uh, the pandemic crisis? Uh, so thinking more about specific initiative, I think that the, the pandemic revealed some, some specific vulnerabilities uh, and it's legitimate to address uh, specific vulnerabilities in any broader social policy, uh, ensuring that there's, uh, that there's access to, continuing access to the kind of uh, training, the language education. Uh, we're looking at a big cohort effect uh, and the cohort effect is not just, as you said, a lot of scarring for young people, effects on, on older people, uh, effects on the cohort of international students who, who would have come in and those who are graduating now, but it's also uh, on uh, those who are on the lowest rungs of the, the, the labor market. Uh, I think that one of the possible uh, ways to, to, to work on, on balance the, to the need to provide support across uh, different categories is to, to look at the, the concentration of immigrants in, uh, in, in temporary occupations, in uh, sectors of uh, employment which are declining and where there's a greater need for skills. So it's not so much about supporting immigrants because they're immigrants, but it's about supporting immigrants because of the kinds of jobs that they do uh, and the, the increased vulnerability they have uh, to, to exclusion. Um, great. And uh, perhaps just before I go back to um, Dimitri and Jean-Christophe, I could just pose another question to you which came in, which was um, specifically regarding your presentation. Um, do you have any data on the employment gap between countries of origin and destination? And how is that changing the broader opportunity differentials that drive people to move? I think this is an interesting question because we talk a bit about demand. I mean, a lot of our discussion is about the demand side and what will the OECD countries be looking for, uh, who will they be admitting, but we haven't really talked about the, uh, let's say the supply side and will there be a change in countries of origin of those who are interested in migrating. Uh, there are a lot of people who didn't migrate in the past year. Uh, and a, a lot of people, so the question is, is that the backlog and how is that backlog of interest in, in migrating going to play out in, in the demand for, for opportunities to emigrate. I think that uh, as long as you have the, this, this imbalance, you're going to continue to see strong interest in countries of origin uh, of going abroad. And I don't think that the pandemic uh, or the health risks uh, are, are a factor in decline in reducing that interest in migration. So there remains a strong interest in migration. It's not just OECD countries, and you have to look at what's happening in Asia, and this is another area where we, monitoring, where we monitor is there has been an enormous collapse in migration to the Gulf. What will happen in the country that traditionally send large numbers of, of workers to other destinations around the world, that, that valve has been shut off. And so I think we need to look and see uh, in the next few years what countries, what origin countries will be looking to, to, to achieve in terms of finding new outlets for uh, for deployment of workers that they have been unable to deploy to the oil producing countries. Thank you. That's super interesting. And um, 
uh, I have just been reminded that I didn't go to Dimitri to uh, pose the, the super skilled global talent question. So Dimitri, I'm very sorry. I didn't forget about your existence. I was just trying to juggle the Q&A. <laughs> I'm glad to know you haven't forgotten my existence. <laughs> Uh, and I, I noticed that you were basically talking about me when you said shorter answers. Thank you. <laughs> but uh, uh, to be serious again, I just wanted to make a very short comment about talent. And I wanted to, um, to say that it very much depends, almost all depends on what will happen after January in the United States. The United States has certain advantages uh, in terms of attracting the best, the most talented people. Uh, you know, people who seek, just like Jean-Christophe said, also social safety and, and you know, uh, people who are, you know, a, an environment that is pro-immigrant and an environment that values difference, et cetera, et cetera, will indeed go to many other places that are in, have all of those things plus provide a good opportunity for a career. Uh, in the United States, prior to all this, uh, people who could come to the United States also had the best opportunity for doing particularly well and getting the best return on the investments in their own human capital. And this is really had been the advantage, you know, in addition to strong institutions, great universities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But people have come in with other ways of attracting very good people. For instance, you know, foreign students having bec have become the lowest hanging fruit in terms of recruitment by certain countries, by many countries, in fact. So. It all depends. After January, do we go back to say we're going to re sort of jigger the formula through which people come to the United States, but the most talented, okay, will have even a greater opportunity to come to the United States and contribute to the United States. And this is really the kind of thinking that I would hope that it's going to take place in the United States, although I'm not holding my breath about this because this is a longer term kind of change rather than an immediate change. That's all I wanted to say. So the hierarchy of, of attraction uh, polls um, is not going to change dramatically. Europe is trying to get its act together, um, you know, and uh, as you know, we have had conversations with um, you know, European colleagues at the most senior level. And, you know, it's going to take a long time before the pact is translated into action. But this may very well be a low-hanging fruit part of the pact. Agreeing, in other words, that indeed bringing talent from the outside is a big economic advantage for Europe. And if they don't have an argument about whether it's going to be the commission or whether it's going to be the commission, the commission in combination with member states, the most likely outcome, then Europe can become finally a player in this. And Europe is a big place. So if they really enter the talent game, uh, it's going to, the impact is going to be felt throughout the country and throughout the world, and it's going to be felt by the more traditional immigration countries that have been attracting uh, talent as well as just people with degrees because I'm glad that in the question you asked you talked about talent rather than people with you know a university degree you know a university degree is a university degree everybody has not one nowadays if you look at what is happening in the developing countries in terms of university education it will become obvious that they're going to be there is always more and more educated people the question is, how do you pick, you know, sort of the juiciest fruit for you to be able to benefit from? Thank you. Um, Jean-Christophe or Jonathan, do you want to come back on that? In particular, this quite provocative question about how we begin to assess talent when a degree is not a reliable indicator. I know that Jonathan and I had a ch chat about this um, about a year ago. Um, if not, I have lots of questions teed up to move, into, move on to. 
Well, maybe just a word. I mean, I think indeed uh, Dimitri is right. Uh, it's not only about uh, it's not only about university degrees, uh, and and we've seen, for example, uh, in the past few years, uh, quite a spread of uh, startup programs uh, throughout the OECD. Uh, I, I I don't know how many countries don't have one yet. Um, but, uh, I mean, you can see that, uh, that it, it goes well beyond, uh, highly skilled or tertiary educated, uh, people. But this is why merit based system, which are, uh, which enable to go beyond, uh, unidimensional approach to talent, uh, are the best suited. And that's what is probably missing in the U.S. right now. Thank you. Um, okay, so I have lots of questions lined up, and please keep them coming. I'm going to try my best to get through all of them. Um, one is um, from someone based in Pakistan, Lisa based in Pakistan, uh, who asks about remittances and how we can, if the pandemic continues, how can we mitigate what will be a devastating impact on remittances? Uh, can I turn back to you, Jean-Christophe, for that question? Well, that's, that's a good question. I think uh, uh, there has been some projection by the World Bank uh, about the evolution of uh, remittances, which shows uh, not such a big impact. Uh, we'll have to see how this plays out at the end. Uh, what is clear is that uh, remittances uh, can go both ways. So uh, in the initial phase of, uh, of the lockdown and pandemic, we actually seen increase in remittances in some corridors notably to Mexico, but uh, elsewhere also, um, because people want to support their family. But if the economy doesn't go back quickly and people don't have, uh, don't make a living in the destination country, yes, this is going to dry up. And as Jonathan just said, as the opportunities in Gulf countries, notably um, because the question was coming from Pakistan, uh, are, are reduced, uh, and, this, uh, I mean, yes, the impact will might be uh, extremely, extremely important, and indeed uh, that may have, uh, let's say, a circular effect on uh, on immigration or, or expectation to emigrate uh, from from this country. So, yes, this is uh, this is a matter of concern. I think uh, on, on that one, I think. We just have to keep up to the SDG and uh, the G20 commitment to reduce your intensity cost. At least that we can do. This is the peril, of course, of looking at things in the summer and trying to draw conclusions about the future. We were at our most optimistic, and we are dealing with data that is that has a lag and difficulties predicting how bad the situation will be. Um, if anyone else wants to chip in on remittances, raise your finger. Otherwise, I'm going to ask um, a, a question about communication, um, which is how can policymakers communicate the benefits of migration uh, at a time when domestic workforces are suffering so much from, from unemployment? Um, and I will turn first to Dimitri, please. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Um, I think that what is important is for governments to have an ongoing conversation with their public about immigration. Um, when the, you know, the, the conversation is sporadic, um, when a case has not been made as to why uh, a country or public policy should be supporting, you know, a healthy amount of immigration, then they're going to have a very hard time explaining all of this. But as long as, and here it's actually sort of turning the question on its head and, 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 and you know, responding by saying the things that we shouldn't be doing. We shouldn't be talking about econometrics and what it is that they tell us about the long run or averages. Publics don't live in the long run. People don't live in the long run. And they don't live in averages. People experience migration in a very direct way in their everyday dealings. Second, we have to really pay much more attention to the people who have not benefited either from immigration or from globalization or from openness. 
and invest in those communities and in those people with the same passion that we invest in other kinds of things. I think this is essential for places not just like the United States, but for Germany and most European countries that have parts of those countries that are not participating in sort of the largesse, you know, the economic vitality, uh, the wealth in, the wealth effect of what we have experienced in the last two or three decades. In the United States, we had an election. I'll finish very quickly. If you look at the electoral map, 60% of the map of the United States is red. These are the people who voted for Trump. And then you look at the sort of the East Coast and the West and the West Coast, and it's all blue. If you don't pay attention to why people continue to vote for Trump, despite all of the things that Mr. Trump did over the last four years, and besides, you know, in, in spite of the personality of the man, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, it should be obvious that you need to pay attention to these people. Many countries have cosmopolitan areas, you know, sort of counties in the language of the United States that are very, very progressive, democratic, wealthy. That's their attraction polls for the most talented, highly educated, etc. But even places that voted for Mr. Biden, if you look at the map of a specific state, you will see that virtually all of the votes, I'm exaggerating, most of the votes that Mr. Biden got came from metropolitan areas. Take Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh, and Philadelphia. That's not the way to move forward in any of this. And if we can't move forward in addressing, you know, the, the, the real concerns of the common people, we are not going to do away with slowly with the divisions and the polarization that are alive and well in so many of our countries. I know people wish it away or wish to wish it away, but guess what? It's not going away. So for those of you who were missing your Twitter feeds and the political punditry, you didn't actually have to give it up. Um, uh, Jean-Christophe, uh, do you have an answer on communication or would you like me to pose a different question? I, I'll, I'll just say that I agree with Dimitri. Uh, go beyond the average and compensate the losers. Don't give up on explaining the real numbers, what is big and what is small. Uh, uh, the United States, for example, is a big country. Uh, as a proportion of its population, it's not a big immigration country. Thank you. Um, Jonathan, you're very welcome to ask, answer that question. I also have a, a thorny policy question for you that I thought might be up your street. <laughs> um, and I know that well, Dimitri and Jean-Christophe spoke a lot about, about automation, about changing labor markets. But the specific question is about if we have more virtual migrant work, what are the policy challenges that that throws up? So I think this is really what you start to see. You started to see this a bit before the pandemic. Uh, and I know we've talked about this, Megan. Uh, and the pandemic has certainly raised it a bit more. Uh, this, uh, if we talk about people who are mobile, but they're not necessarily going to the country where they're doing the work. So these are people, it's a, there's a, a big part of this is a tax issue. Where are you tax? Where you live, where you work, where you, where you come from. But there's also a question of uh, how does that affect your migration policy? If you have uh, these so-called digital nomads and they're wandering around the world, do you count them uh, the same way that you would count your traditional migrants who you assume will come and stay for the entire period of their contract and settle? Uh, if you're trying to attract people for, let's say, demographic reasons, but your labor market is weak, can you attract people who are actually working somewhere else? Uh, this is still a niche phenomenon. It's not the, the big story. Uh, it's compared with outsourcing. It's it, the actual uh, movement is still pretty small, but I think it will become much, much, much more important. And you can see in some OECD countries already an attempt to create uh, favorable regimes, permit regimes for people who don't actually work there, work in a third country. Uh, 
to try to benefit from low cost of living and, uh, and quality of life, even when there are no jobs to be offered. So uh, I know some people took advantage of the, this new Bermuda measure to go to Bermuda during the pandemic. Uh, but it is, countries like Estonia have started to introduce this. But it's again, these are still, uh, let's say, some pilot initi uh, initiatives to respond to what is uh, a bit uh, difficult phenomenon to touch. Thank you. I'm still dreaming of Bermuda and have my, yeah, it's on my to do list, move to Bermuda for a year. Um, thank you. That was a really thoughtful answer. Um, and we are coming towards the end of time, and I uh, like to finish on time. So I'm going to cluster together a few different questions that we've had and pose it to all three speakers. And these are about non-economic streams of migration um, and the implications of the pandemic. So firstly, um, what do we think that the impact of the pandemic will be on, on refugee protection and resettlement? Um, secondly, on family migration and thirdly, on temporary migration. So we had those three questions come in separately. I pose them together and I'd love to start with Jean-Christophe, please. Well, yes, on resettlement, this is a really good question because uh, 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 the, the operations for resettlement has been paused uh, during uh, the lockdowns. Um, it will it will resume, but will a country catch up with the numbers they uh, they promised? Uh, some countries said they will, like Canada. Uh, for some others, uh, it's not obvious. Uh, I've just I mean, seeing that the uh, president elected in, in the United States uh, will uh, uh, or propose to increase the number of resettlement places uh, uh, to 125,000, if I don't mistaken, that would be tripling the number of resettlement places uh, over the uh, world while, which uh, would uh, certainly be uh, a very good news. Uh, but uh, clearly, the some operational issues uh, regarding transportation and health checks uh, that needs to be uh, overcome. Family migration is a big question. Um, because uh, in most countries, except for nationals, but for visiting with foreigners, uh, you have some income thresholds. Uh, and uh, taking into account the uh, state of the labor market, it's possible that uh, family migration would be difficult for a large number of people. And this is very important uh, as, as a legal pathway, but also as a legal complementary pathway, also for those in need of protection uh, when they have temporary refugee status, for example. And so this is uh, an area to watch, and uh, maybe also that some country will also show some flexibility in these rules. Thank you. And um, I'm going to go to Dimitri last so that I can cut you off. Uh, so, Jonathan, please. So, on the question of uh, of family, I mean, I think it's just, with family, what we see is this, that it's a continuous category, that, that uh, and I would expect that uh, will continue to be that way. One of the questions is uh, income thresholds for family reunification, whether this leads to a, a decline uh, in the possibility for we didn't for family reunification. We didn't see a very strong effect in the last crisis. Uh, so I don't think we would see so much of that now, and there may be some uh, conditions. On the question of temporary migrants, and, and, and I saw some questions in the chat box as well, uh, the temporary migration, I think there's a risk during the pandemic that it all becomes about essential workers. Today's essential workers aren't tomorrow's essential workers. And so if we get into the trap of restricting migration as much as possible to what we consider essential, it's uh, it's, it's it's potentially uh, can distort what, what, what happens in the temporary migration streams in the future as, as, uh, as these definitions shift. Uh, I think that the, what you always have in the situation of crisis it reveals one of the, the paradoxes about temporary migration programs is that they're generally sold, they're, they're justified on the basis of a demand, uh, that this demand, and you sell it to the public saying this is, these people are admitted to do a job that, and only on the basis of this job, and if the job disappears, then they go. Uh, and in the situation, uh, a crisis, sometimes that job disappears, but that old policy reasoning doesn't always get applied in every country uh, of sending everyone out, but rather there's a, a reaction to try to find another solution 
Uh, and so I think that the temporary migration uh, will continue to be one of the main streams uh, for initial arrival. And uh, this, this idea that uh, this is only contingent on the job is maybe moving a bit into the background and that countries are seeing it more as, uh, as the, the first the landing spot rather than, uh, let's say, a, recycle, a, a continuous cycle. Thank you very much for that thoughtful answer and for picking up the, the, the great conversation that was in, in the chat as well. Uh, so, Dimitri, two, two minutes, one minute, optimistically. I am not even going to open up my mouth because clearing my throat takes me a minute. Um, I'll try to make it a little easy. Uh, I think that refugees are likely to benefit from, uh, um, you know, the decisions of governments. I think that the right to territorial asylum, all of these migrant flows, are likely to uh, suffer greatly. Um, I think that. Um, Family migration and particularly family, but also temporary, will very much depend on how deep the anti immigration passions are running in each country, you know, where immigration is a terribly um, political, terrible political issue. You're likely to see a, the government trying to narrow the pathways. But I think more important than what the government do is what the sponsors, the family sponsors of family immigrants are likely to do because in many of our countries there's a requirement that they be responsible for the people that they that they sponsor. So we should not forget that. And with regard to temporary migration, again in some countries it will make an awful lot of sense not to commit to a permanent migration. So temporary migration makes a lot of sense for them, but in countries where we are as confused as we are in the United States about temporary workers, primarily because of fear of exploitation, uh, this is going to be another issue that's going to be very difficult to try to anticipate what will happen. Did I do two minutes? <laughs> you were extremely disciplined. Thank you. And thank you so much to all three of you. You've all been... <laughs> Extremely thoughtful, uh, very candid, and also willing to uh, provide comments on a, on a really rich and diverse set of topics. I start, it started off saying this was a period of uncertainty and it was difficult to make any kind of predictions. But we've all I think we've had a very robust conversation about what to look out for and what possible scenarios might unfold. Um, and um, I wanted to point you all to the International Migration Outlook from the OECD if you haven't yet looked at it. And if you'd like to lobby Jonathan and Jean-Christophe for a, a half-year version, I was thinking that, you know, it was uh, a, an odd time to release it since we don't yet know how uh, the pandemic will unfold. So if you could do another version in six months, we'd all be really grateful as researchers. On the MPI side, we have a, a whole COVID page with lots of um, uh, information on some of the issues we were just ending with on the implications for, for protection and refugee resettlement and family migration. And then the, um, the audio and uh, video from today's discussion will be available on our website tomorrow. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, audience, for some great questions. Sorry if we didn't get to them all. We tried our best. Um, this has been a really great discussion. Thanks, and have a good day.